Good morning. So today's lecture is going to be asynchronous. So you'll be uh, looking at the recording of this. If you have any questions, you can reach me via email. I will still be having my office hours on Wednesday as normal. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to answer everything uh, with that. But uh, today we're going to introduce the subject that we introduced in the lab on Friday. And that's uh, the idea of torque. Um, in the lab, we talked about uh, how torque influences uh, moving objects or rotating objects. Here, we're going to look at how torque influences stationary objects. And so that, can, that is called rotational equilibrium. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. But basically, we're going to start by talking about the motion of rigid bodies. So a rigid body is not deformed by the forces acting on it. So the shape is constant. So the only forces acting either influence the motion or they cancel out the other forces so that there is no motion. And so it's going to be one or the other. It has nothing to do with the shape. Different points on a rotating body will have different values for the velocity and the acceleration. So this is the linear velocity or the linear acceleration. So if you remember when we were talking about circular motion uh, a couple of chapters ago, that the linear velocity is equal to the radius, the radius being the distance from the axis of rotation to the point where you're uh, looking multiplied by the angular velocity. So the uh, frequency with which it's rotating in terms of radians per second. And uh, similarly, the linear acceleration, and this is something we talked about in um, the lab class. The linear acceleration is equal to R times alpha, where alpha is the angular acceleration. Well, spend more time talking about alpha in uh, the next chapter, chapter 10. Um, but you know, it's the same general idea that um, the actual speed or you know, the magnitude of the acceleration in terms of meters per second squared or the magnitude of the velocity in terms of meters per second uh, of something that is rotating is equal to the distance uh, that you are away or that the object is away from the axis of rotation multiplied by either the angular velocity, if you're talking about linear velocity, or the angular acceleration. Remember, angular velocity is measured in radians per second. Angular acceleration, when we get to it, is radians per second squared. So now we're going to introduce uh, torque. And it, we talked about torque a little bit on Friday. But torque is the rotational analog of force. So we're going to define what's called the moment arm vector, which points from the axis of rotation to the location where the force is being applied. And um, if theta is the angle that the force vector makes with R, then the magnitude of the torque is equal to R times F times the sine of theta. So torque depends on three things. Uh, the force that's acting, the distance from the axis of rotation. No. The distance from the axis of rotation to the point where the force is acting. And then the sine of uh, the angle between the force vector and the uh, moment arm vector. So let's see if we can visualize this a little bit at least in general. So we have a point that's the axis of rotation. And so let's say we have an object here that's mass M and it's located a certain distance maybe perhaps above the uh, the axis of rotation. So we have the moment arm vector, again, points from the axis of rotation to 
um, the object. And we'll say the object has a mass m so that gravity is acting on it. And we'll say that it's, um, uh, you can think of it maybe as uh, an object that's uh, hanging from a spoke on a wheel, for example. And so you have gravity. And so the force is equal to mg. And it's in the downward direction. And then theta would be the angle that the force and the moment arm vector make with each other. And so the magnitude of the moment arm vector is the distance from the object or from the axis to the point where the force is acting. And so we'll uh, go through a couple of examples um, of how this works, you know, later on in uh, um, today's class. But that's the, you know the basic uh, mechanism of how, you know how this works. And so torque influences rotation. Uh, so the greater the torque, the easier it is to get an object to start rotating. So it's not just the force that's acting, but also the distance away from the axis of rotation that it's acting. So I'm going to try to illustrate it. I hope this is visible enough. And so we have a door right here. And so I the hinge is the axis of rotation. So the hinge of the door is right over here. So I push at the other edge of the door, which is as far away from the hinge as possible. And it's very easy to get the door to rotate. However, if I try to push really close to the hinge where the value of R is small, it's a bit harder to get the rotation uh, going. So the same force generates quite a bit less torque and uh, you have to act harder um, or you have to exert more force, you know, to get the door to rotate easily. And that's the basic idea behind torque. So with that, um, some other properties of torque. It is a vector quantity. It has magnitude and it has direction. Now this uh, second point is not as important in a non-majors class or in a non-calculus class as it would be for the physics majors and the pre-engineering students. But the direction of the torque vector is not actually in the direction of the rotation, but it follows the axis of rotation. So if you need to know the direction of the torque vector, you apply what's called a right-hand rule. You curl your fingers in the direction that the rotation, uh, of the rotation that the torque would cause. And then your thumb points in the direction of the torque vector. The unit of torque is the Newton meter. Note that that's different from the joule. And um, so, and ultimately the distinction is made because the joule or any of the units of energy uh, or any of the different types of energy, whether it's work, kinetic energy, potential energy, um, uh, the, the energy is a scalar. So uh, calculating energy and calculating torque are not exactly the same thing, even though they both involve multiplying a force by a distance. So it's not exactly the same thing. And so that's why there's a distinction. So torque doesn't have its own uh, special unit, but the unit of work and energy you know, the different types of energy is the joule. So it's given a special distinction. And again, the joule only applies to scalars. Uh, the Newton meter uh, applies to the torque vector. So let's get to an example. When opening a door, you push on it perpendicularly with the force of 55.0 Newtons at a distance of 0 0.850 meters from the hinges. What torque are you exerting relative to the hinges? And does it matter if you push at the same height as the hinges? So we'll answer part B first. The answer to that question is no. Uh, that the entire length of the hinge corresponds to the axis of rotation. And basically the moment arm vector is 
uh, the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the uh, point where the force is acting. So it does not matter if you push at the same height as the hinges. But uh, let's visualize this. So, we have the door, and so we'll draw the door like what I have. So we have the handle here, and we have the hinges I'll put them like that. Okay, and so we'll say we're pushing at a distance of zero point um, eight five zero meters from the hinge. And so we'll say we're pushing a little bit above the hinge. That's probably a bit more realistic. And so again, you want the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the point. So that's the R vector. And it's pointing like that. And you're pushing perpendicular at that location. So the force is equal to uh, 55.0 Newtons. And the moment arm vector, the magnitude of the moment arm vector is 0 0.850 meters. So again, the moment arm vector is just the distance from the axis of rotation or the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation if it's located over, if it's, if the axis is a line as opposed to a specific point, you want the perpendicular distance um, from the axis of rotation to the point where the force is acting. And then theta, we're pushing perpendicularly into the door. So um, theta is, then equal to, and since R points across the door, um, theta is equal to 90 degrees. And so the sine of theta then is equal to one. So if you are pushing the door at an angle, you would generate less torque. If, uh, um, you might need a door that uh, you know, has a tight spring so it's not so easy to open, to notice that. But if you were to push on the door at an angle, it'd be harder to open than if you push uh, straight into it. So the torque is equal to R times F times the sine of theta. And so that's 0 0.850 meters multiplied by 55.0 Newtons and multiply by the sine of 90, which we know is one. And so you plug those, you put those together. Yeah. I'm busy. I think it's interesting that we have a fish who's smaller than he's supposed to be. Okay, I am busy. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Yes, and so that's uh, 46.8 Newton meters. And so that's how much torque you generate when you push uh, on the hinge of the door with a 55.0 Newton force at a distance of 0 0.850 meters away from the hinge. And so again, if you um, uh, exert the same force closer to the hinge so that R is uh, smaller, you generate less torque it's harder to get the door open. And if you exert the same force a little bit further out, uh, assuming you're not already at the edge of the door, uh, then you generate more torque and it's easier to open the, uh, the door. Okay, so with that, let's move on to the next example.
Okay, so this is number two. When tightening a bolt, you push perpendicularly on a wrench with the force of 165 Newtons at a distance of 0 0.140 meters from the center of the bolt. So how much torque are you exerting in Newton meters relative to the center of the bolt? So uh, I'm going to need to draw a wrench here, which might be easier said than done. So um, this is Thor, by the way. And um, so let's see, let's test my drawing ability. So, So, all right, let's see if I can. Okay, so here's the bolt, here's the wrench. And so what we're told is that uh, you push perpendicularly on a wrench with the force of 165 Newtons at a distance of 0 0.140 meters from the center of the bolt. So let's say you're up here. And so this is the moment arm vector. And so that's um, 0 0.140 meters and you're pushing upwards right at that point. And so it's perpendicularly that you're pushing on the wrench. So basically you're getting the maximum amount of torque given the force that you're applying and the distance away from the center of the bolt that you're applying it. So you're putting a force that's equal to uh, 165 Newtons. And you're asked how much torque are you generating? And so the torque again is equal to R times F times the sine of theta. Again, in this example, theta is 90. The force is perpendicular to the moment arm vector. So theta is 90 and the sine of theta is equal to one. So that's 160 Newtons multiplied by 0 0.140 meters. And you're asked how many Newton meters of torque is that? So you plug the numbers in. And so that's 22.4 Newton meters. And again, you're hoping that's enough uh, torque to get the uh, bolt to move. Sometimes those bolts are, you know, have been uh, in place for a while. And so, uh, you know, getting them to tighten further to loosen up a little bit can sometimes be a challenge. So you're hoping that's enough uh, torque. If you applied, if you ex uh, you applied your force closer to the bolt than the end of the wrench, it would be a lot harder. And so that's basically what torque is. And maybe some, if some of you have worked with a um, wrench, you have some idea what I mean as far as that goes. Okay, so the rest of the chapter, and it's not a very long chapter, is devoted to talking about rotational or static equilibrium. So we talked a little bit about equilibrium when we were talking about Newton's uh, laws, that if an object is in a state of equilibrium, that means the net force acting on the object is zero, or which another way of saying the vector sum of all the forces acting on the object is zero. With rotational equilibrium, there is a dis a, an additional term. So not only is the net force zero, but the net torque is zero as well. So not only is it not moving in the horizontal or the vertical sense, it's being held in place, it's also not rotating. So something could be, um, uh, something could be held in place, in which case the net force acting on it is zero, but if it's rotating, the torque may not be zero. And so that's an 
um, that is not an example of static equilibrium. The other thing to keep in mind is that force and torque are vectors. So there are multiple components involved. So with forces, that means the sum of the X components equals zero, the sum of the Y components equals zero. And if it's a three dimensional problem, the sum of the Z components equals zero. With torque, uh, we're gonna focus on uh, one dimension. Um, I mean, the rotation is in two dimensions. And remember the torque vector is perpendicular to the rotation actually, because the, uh, the torque vector points along the axis. Um, so we're only gonna look at what we call clockwise and counterclockwise torques. And so we set one direction, usually counterclockwise to be positive and the other direction, which is clockwise to be negative. So you have positive torques and you have negative torques and in rotational equilibrium, those torques will add to zero. The best thing or you know, the trick to solving, the most important trick to solving rotational equilibrium problems, well, if there is no rotation, where is the axis of rotation? And the answer is the axis of rotation is anywhere you want it to be. And any place you define as the axis of rotation, the torques around that point will still be zero if the object is not moving. So what you do then is you define the axis of rotation at a location that simplifies the math for you. And hopefully you'll, you'll see some of this uh, in these three examples. So we're gonna do these three examples and that's actually it for the chapter. We're gonna do more problems on Friday. But uh, anyway, let's start with the first example. We have two children of mass 20.0 kilograms and 30.0 kilograms sit balanced on a seesaw with the pivot point located at the center of the seesaw. If the children are separated by a distance of 3.00 meters, at what distance from the pivot point is the small child sitting in order to maintain the balance? So let's set this up. And usually the most important thing with a rotational equilibrium problem is just to draw it. So you have your seesaw. You have a pivot point. And ideally it would be in the center, but I didn't draw it all that well. Okay, so you have two children, mass 20 kilograms and 30 kilograms. They are separated by a distance of 3.00 meters. So, And that's one and so stick figures, I apologize for my artwork, but we do the best we can. So they're separated by a distance of 3.00 meters. And at what distance from the pivot point is the small child sitting in order to maintain the balance? Okay, so we'll call the distance the large from the larger child x1. And then for the smaller child, x2. Okay, so here, the easiest place to choose the pivot point is the center. Uh, and so if you choose the center, then you have a torque from, this, uh, from one child to the left and a torque from the other child to the right. Now let's draw the forces. So the forces acting on the children are their weights. Um, so we have, M1 times G, and we have M2 times G. So those are the forces that are acting. And we're going to assume the seesaw is balanced horizontally unless it tells us otherwise. So the net force is zero and the net torque is zero. The net force is 
are, are um, the forces or the downward forces are balanced by the pivot point. Um, but we're going to take the pivot point as the axis of rotation. So um, if the uh, axis of rotation is at a point where, and we'll call that the normal force because that's basically what it is. If we define the pivot point to be the location where the normal force is acting, then it generates zero torque. Remember, torque depends not only on the forces, but the distance you're away from the axis of rotation. So if you're on the axis of rotation, or if a particular force is right at the axis of rotation, it's generating zero torque. So uh, this normal force is balancing out the downward weights, but it doesn't affect the torques involved. So the torques involved are the forces. So you have M1 times G multiplied by the distance it is away from the axis, which we'll call X1. And relative to the pivot point, that is a counterclockwise torque. It would cause counterclockwise rotation. The second child's weight or the smaller child's weight is in the um, uh, is to the right. That would be a clockwise rotation. So we'll subtract that. So that's m two g, and then that distance is x two, and that's equal to zero. Again, the net torque acting has to equal zero. So we have those two forces, and again, the upward force at the pivot point. Um, it's generating no torque because it's at the axis of rotation. So its moment arm is zero. So we don't need the G, the G terms. So M1 X1 is equal to M2 X2. And we also know that X1 plus X2 is equal to 3.00 meters. So, Let's substitute here. What we were asked to solve for the distance from the pivot point the small child is sitting. So that's x2. So we'll solve this equation for x1. We'll divide both sides by m1 so that x1 is equal to m2 over m1 times x2. And then we can plug that into here. So we have m2 over m1 times x2 plus x2 is equal to 3.00 meters. Now we can factor this out. So x2 times one plus m2 over m1 is equal to 3.00 meters. And then we just divide by this. So, um, so x2, is equal to 3.00 meters divided by one plus M2, which is uh, 20.0 kilograms or and M1 is 30.0 kilograms. So that's 20.0 kilograms divided by 30.0 kilograms. And um, that gives us the distance that X2 away is away from the pivot point. And you can see from my drawing that it should be a little bit for uh, the smaller child should be further away from uh, than the larger child. There's a greater gravitational force associated with the larger child. So in order for the torques to be equal, the larger child has to be closer to the pivot point. So let's figure that out. So that's three divided by, and then parentheses, one plus 20 divided by 30. So in the parentheses, you get 1.67. And so it's three divided by 1.67, that gives 1.8 meters. So, the lighter child or the smaller child is 1.8 meters away 
and that's 1.80. So 1.80 meters away, the larger child is 1.20 meters away, but they generate the same torque. So 1.8 times 20 is, um, so that's 36 times G. That would tell you how much uh, torque. And then it'd be 30 times 1.2 times G, which is also 36 times G uh, Newton meters worth of torque. So they generate the same amount of torque, which means the system is in balance and the um, seesaw doesn't move. So again, it's just a, it's a question of the uh, two children positioning themselves just right and they can hang suspended in the air at least until one of them twitches a little bit and that would cause a little bit of imbalance okay so now let's move on to another example and this one comes with its own diagram a 17.0 meter high and 11.0 meter long wall uh so Think of the wall as pointing into the uh, board or into the page. Under construction and its bracing are shown in figure 9.31. So the bracing is designed to keep the wall from falling over. And you see it's the bracing is held at an angle of 35 degrees relative to the vertical. The wall is in stable equilibrium without the bracing but can pivot at its base. So calculate the force exerted by each of the 10 braces. So there are 10 braces positioned, again, you sort of assume evenly spaced going into the, um, uh, you know, assume they're evenly spaced and, uh, you know, going into the uh, this sort of a row that's going into the board or into the page. So calculate the force exerted by each of the 10 braces if a strong wind exerts a horizontal force of 650 newtons on each square meter of the wall. So assume that the net force as the, from the wind acts at a height halfway up the wall. So you know, the wind is acting across the entire wall, but for the purpose of evaluating the torque generated by the wind, uh, we are going to treat all the um, wind as acting at the center of the wall. And uh, so calculate the, uh, so assume the net force of the wind acts at a height halfway up the wall and that all braces exert equal forces parallel to their length. So neglect the thickness of the wall. So we're not concerned about the uh, thickness of the wall in this problem. So how does this work? Okay, so clear this. So here's the ground. We have a wall. Uh, this is the center of the wall. Uh, so again, we're treating all of the wind as acting at the center. So we'll call that F sub W for the force of the wind. And it's acting at the center. And then you have these bracings acting at an angle of 35 degrees. Okay, and he's, yeah, so that's the angle that makes with the vertical. So the first thing you wanna figure out is the total force of the wind. So the force of the wind is um, 650, Newtons per square meter, we're given that. So we're gonna to need to multiply that by the area of the wall. And so that's 17.0 meters high. There's high and 11.0 meters wide. 
So again, so you're multiplying the force per unit area divided by the area of the, or multiplying it by the area of the wall. And so you get, and I will express this in scientific notation. So that's 1.22 times 10 to the five newtons. So that's the net force that the wind is exerting on the wall. So what you need then is the force exerted by the bracings. Now the bracings push directly into the wall. So that force is, we'll call that force F sub B. And so that has a horizontal component and it has a vertical component. Uh, you know, that's pushing into the wall, but uh, we're going to ignore the forces acting on the wall itself, whether it's gravity or whether it's the um, uh, ground, but we're interested in uh, the torques. And so the bracings exert a torque and the uh, wind exerts a torque. And so, uh, And okay, so the bracings go up to the halfway point. So that's, let me redraw that so that's clearer. So the bracings go up to the halfway point as well. And that's too big of an angle. All right, so something like that. All right, so this is 35.0 degrees. And so again, the force of the bracing is directly into uh, the wall. So it points along, uh, so it's at an angle. It's not perpendicularly into the wall, but it follows uh, you know, the uh, direction of the bracing itself. So that's the direction uh, of the force that's exerted. And so the net torque treating the axis of rotation as the uh, base of the wall, the net torque has to equal zero. And again, any forces, uh, any forces that gravity exerts are along the length of the wall, so they generate no torque. Um, so the force and the moment arm vectors would be the same in that case. The um, Uh, the force of the ground is right at the axis of rotation. So that's also generating no torque. So we're only interested in the force of the wall and the force of the bracing. And you can see they're in opposite directions. The force of the bracing would generate a counterclockwise torque. If it were completely unbalanced, um, that would tip the uh, wall over to the left. And if the force of the wind were unbalanced, it would tip the wall over to the right. So we're treating the bracing as a clockwise torque and the uh, wind as, or rather the bracing as a counterclockwise torque, excuse me. And the wind is generating a clockwise torque. So the torque due to the bracings Uh, minus the torque due to the wind equals zero. So that's the condition of rotational equilibrium. So how do you figure out the torque due to the bracing? Well, the torque due to the bracing is, and we're gonna put the number 10 in here because there are 10 braces and we're asked to find the force of each individual brace. So that's 10 times the force due to each individual brace. That's the total force. The moment arm vector so let's get the dimensions here. It's um, the wall is 17 meters high. So this is 8.5 meters and 8.5 meters. Um, so that's 17.0 meters. And then half of that is 8.5 meters. <clears throat> 
for 8.50 meters. So we'll call that R. It winds up being the same for both. So it's not gonna be that important. So it's R and then the sign of the angle that the, um, the uh, uh, force makes with the moment arm vector. So the moment arm vector, again, the axis of rotation is at the base of the wall. The point where the force is acting is the middle of the wall. So it's straight up. The force is at making an angle of 35.0 degrees with the vertical. So that's the sine of 35 degrees. And so that's the torque generated by the bracings. And that's going to equal the torque generated by the wind, which is the force of the wind multiplied by R. Again, the distance, uh, again, the total force of the wind can be said to act from, you know, when, for, for the purpose of calculating torque, you can treat the total force of the wind as act, you know, acting on the wall as acting at the center of the wall. So that's FW times R, and it's going to be the same R for both. And this is completely perpendicular. This force is completely perpendicular to the wall. And again, the moment arm vector points up from the base of the wall. So that's 90 degrees. And the sine of 90, again, is 1. So the torque generated by the force in the wall is just the force of the wall times R. So we don't actually know, need to know what the value of R is uh, for this point. And so we're asked to solve for the force of the individual bracing. So that's FB is equal to FW, which we know. And so that's uh, 1.22 times 10 to the 5 Newtons. And you're dividing that by 10. Uh, because each bracing bears um, you know, the weight equally. And it's 10 times the sine of 35 degrees. So the bracings are at an angle. So let's figure all that out. So, That's 1.22 times 10 to the 5. Divided by 10. Divided by the sine of 35. And so what we get is each bracing has a force of, or exerts a force of 2.12 times 10 to the four, again, going to scientific notation, Newtons. So the bracings uh, keep the wall up with the force of 2.12 times 10 to the four Newtons. And so, you know, that's preventing, you know, that's what's protecting the wall from being knocked over in the wind. And again, the bracings, you know, in general, because the wall is under construction, uh, you know, that it hasn't been fully cemented in place. Uh, and so that um, you need this bracing in case there's a strong wind that uh, knocks it over and ruins the work that you've done to that point. Okay, so that's the second of our three examples. And now we're going to move on to the last of our three examples. And then we're going to be done for today. And so this is a biological example. So even when the head is held erect, so you looked at this figure, its center of mass is not directly over the principal point of support. And um, so you see the center of mass, basically the middle of the brain, but the uh, principal point of support is the joint between the spinal column and the skull or the atlanto-occipital joint say that 20 times fast. And that's, that's not centered, it's at closer to the back of your neck. Uh, so it's not fully centered. 
The muscles at the back of the neck should therefore exert a force to keep the head erect. That's why your head falls forward when you fall asleep in the class. Um, so, uh, um, you know, that when those muscles relax, again, your center of mass is uh, in front of the, um, the base of support. So if there aren't, you know, if the muscles uh, at the back of the neck relax, which is what happens when you fall asleep, then you've got a clockwise torque, or at least a clockwise relative to this vantage point that's tilting the head forward. And uh, that'll tilt the head forward. So we'll, we'll look at this in a bit more detail. So you're asked to calculate the force exerted by these muscles using the information in the figure. And then what is the force exerted by the pivot on the head. And so that's FJ, if you look closely at the diagram and if you look in your book, FJ is the force exerted by the pivot. But we're first asked for the force exerted by these muscles. So to solve this problem, we are going to need uh, the two equations uh, of rotational equilibrium. The first is that the net force is equal to zero. The second is that the net torque is equal to zero. And we'll actually need the second question to solve part A. So step one, and with uh, rotational equilibrium problems, it's absolutely imperative, visualize it. So um, I'll draw a horizontal line. So uh, the forces at the of uh, you know at the back of the neck, and so that's a downward force exerted by the muscles. So I won't bother to draw the head or the skull, but if you want to refer back to the diagram in the book, uh, go right ahead. So uh, you have that. You have five centimeters to the right. And that's 5.0 centimeters. Okay, so 5.0 centimeters. And so that's the, that support point corresponds to, again, the joint at the, you know, uh, between the spinal column and um, uh, your skull at that point. And um, then, Further to the right and a little bit up, you have the center of gravity. And so that force is downward and it's equal to the weight of the skull, which we're giving as 50 Newtons. And so, We'll call this distance RCG. And that, that's the distance from the pivot point to the center of gravity. So that's the moment arm vector for there. And it's going to make an angle of theta with um, uh, the gravitational force, the downward gravitational force. And That distance is, so it's five centimeters to the pivot point. It's another 2.5 centimeters to the center of gravity. Okay. So you have some distances. So we don't know the distance from the pivot point to the center of gravity, but if you look closely, you realize we don't need to. And so because uh, the torque will be equal to F times R times the sine of theta. Well, R times the sine of theta, we do know that's 2.5 centimeters. So that's something to keep in mind as we go on. And then the last thing we want is the force 
at the joint, uh, which is labeled, which is an upward force, which is equal to F times J. Okay, and so that's the upward force. Okay, so we have the two equations the, uh, for rotational equilibrium, the net force equals zero, the net torque equals zero. We are gonna start with the second equation, the net torque is equal to zero. And the reason for that is that um, if you choose as the axis of rotation, the pivot point, then uh, the force, the upward force acting at the joint doesn't generate any torque. Uh, again, because it's at, if it's at the axis of rotation, you know, if the force is acting at the axis of rotation, it generates no torque. So that just leaves us with these two forces. This, uh, the force due to the muscles at the back of the neck, which is a counterclockwise torque. And then the force due to the center of gravity of the brain uh, plus the skull. And that's um, 50 Newtons of torque. Or rather, I mean, that's a clockwise torque. It's 50 Newtons of force. So let's figure out how this works. So, and we're, we're ultimately solving for FM, the force of the muscles at the back of the neck. So, the torque due to the muscles minus the torque due to the center of gravity equals zero. So, um, that's Fm might, or multiplied by the distance away it is from the axis of rotation. So for now, we'll call that R, R sub M. The force is perpendicular to the moment arm. So the moment arm points horizontally, the force is vertical. So we don't need to worry about forces or we don't need to worry about angles rather. Now we look over here. So that's minus the force of the center of gravity which we know to be, which is a value we know, multiplied by R, so the moment arm of the center of gravity, multiplied by the sine of theta. And that equals zero. Now again, we don't know what the distance is from the pivot point to the center of gravity. We don't know what theta is, but we do know what R sine theta is. We know that R times the sine of theta gives us 2.5 centimeters. So uh, we have the information we need to solve the problem. And so we're asked to solve for FM. So you have the force to the center of gravity times RCG times the sine of theta. Uh, just bringing that to the other side. And then you're dividing that by R sub M. So now we can plug numbers in. So that's 50 Newtons. And again, R times the sine of theta is equal to 2.5 centimeters. I am actually going to leave that as it is. I mean, you can convert it to meters if you want, but the denominator is also in centimeters. So it'll cancel out. So 50 Newtons multiplied by 2.5 centimeters divided by 5.0 centimeters. And so that gives 25 Newtons. Okay, so the forces that, or the muscles at the back of the neck are pulling down on your head from the back of the neck with about a 25 Newton force. And that's, you know, that's when you're holding your head up and that's when you're conscious about it. And you get that from the fact that the net torques are equal to zero, but then we're asked for, and this is part B, the force exerted by the pivot on the head. So that's FJ, the force exerted at the joint. For that, 
we'll use the second equation, which it states that the net force acting uh, on the head has to equal zero if they're in equilibrium. So we have three forces, two of them are down and one is up. So the upward force Fj minus Fm, since it points down, and minus the force at the center of gravity equals zero. So this points up, this points down, this points down. You add the upward forces, you subtract the downward forces, you get zero. So then F sub J, just adding the other terms to both sides of the equation, F sub J is equal to FM plus FCG. But we know both of those. FM is 25 Newtons. So it's 25 Newtons. And then the force at the center of gravity is given to us as 50 Newtons. You add them together, it's simple, straightforward addition, it's 75 Newtons. So the force that the joint exerts to keep the head upright and not tilting in either direction is 75 Newtons in this case. And getting back to what they said when um, the, uh, um, uh, you know, about uh, your head tilting forward, you know, if you fall asleep, if you're sitting upright and you fall asleep, the muscles at the back of the neck will relax. And so you no longer have that force, which means relative to the pivot point, you have an unbalanced torque tilting your head forward. And, um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's basically what he's saying. If you, that's why your head tilts forward if you fall asleep in class. The muscles in the back of the neck relax, you know, that were pulling your head back. And so as a result, your head tilts forward. Okay, so that's all we're going to do from this chapter today. On Friday, we are gonna go over uh, six problems from this chapter before getting to the lab final. So um, again, I won't be around tomorrow. I mean, I'll be around to answer questions by, via email um, tomorrow or you know, meaning Tuesday um, afternoon. And then Wednesday, I'll have my regular office hours. So if you need to contact me, you can do that. And then uh, otherwise, I will see you uh, Friday, again, to go over more specific examples from this chapter, and uh, then also to do the lab final. So enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you soon.